Like Zoom background. Yeah, sorry. I know, right? Um, anyway, so we were uh, just in a just in the session where there was a lot said and a lot shared. Um, I think since we're kind of taking a pause and reorganizing here, um, how would people feel if we went back and addressed any things that were said by Makari and Lee? Did Makari make it over here with us? I don't see her. I see Lee. I don't think I've I don't think I've added her yet. Okay. Well, she might have gone the wrong direction. That's possible. She kept pointing, and then I was like, "Go oh, that way." I know. I know. I know. It reverses it, right? But Lee is here at least. So, um, first of all, does anybody have any questions you'd like to ask about anything that was presented in the beginning? Like myself and Lee can maybe. Um, try to answer these or any of us really can because we're a community of uh you know very uh interested and engaged people here so it's a situation too where you can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh ask just through your mic if you like it's a small enough group to do that so first of all i'll just offer are there any questions or anything that was said so far that you want to highlight talk about um ask about Wait time is a little different in these virtual meetings, isn't it? Right? <laughs> you, have, you have the wait for the nerves to speak up time, and then you have the wait for the find the unmute find button. Find the time. unmute button time. Here's a pro tip for Google Meets. Control D, or if you're on a Mac, Command D will unmute and mute your microphone. That's a little keyboard shortcut one of the students taught me. That might be the most important thing I've learned from the distance limit, distance learning summit so far. Well, then we then let's shut her down. Everybody out. We're good. <laughs> Jeff learned how to unmute. All right. No, just okay. Wait. All right. So let's go ahead, and it seems like uh, the requests to enter have settled down. Uh, so go ahead, and we can restart. Yeah, I see. I just see a question. Oh, there's my dog saying hello. Um, so there's a question from Mary, if anybody wants to handle that. Um, I like to hear more about how teachers are able to hold students accountable as they are grading while also being focused on SEL. So balancing out the need or, um, yeah, I guess we'll call it a need to grade or is it a need even? Maybe that's a good question. Um, while we also focus on supporting SEL. How do we find that balance? Glenn, Amy? Yes, Lee? I, I was I was going to jump in there real quick. This Glenn, um, that was actually the first thing that we had to really focus on as a staff and as a district when we had that one week period uh, that the governor gave us, and that was the concept of there is this thing where we want to hold people or in this case our students accountable. This need, and mm -hmm. we believe that it came from. Even before we started, we knew this was going to happen. That it's it's this need to control, to be able to control. Um, and we made it clear that that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> that we needed to find a different way and a different path because this was completely unique. But it also afforded us some opportunities to be able to explore different ways of being able to um, not only engage our students but to be able to evaluate their progress. And in a meaningful way. So I think in my slide, I put something about formative checks versus summative exams. And I think that Amy was referring to that. So it was uh, Pang. It just basically kind of reframing some things that we talk about all the time in education, but we never fully, it, it's never, it, it's, especially not in a nationwide or even statewide kind of thing, it's never fully adopted a, as a thing where we say, 
hey, really, we should be uh, promoting growth versus you know this end product or whatever else it might be in judging in that and evaluating in that fashion. So it, it is a reframing for us as educators to say what is the most important part of what ends up happening here through the next month, you know, in, in our case, or next in this past month and in this month to come. And for us, we wanted to make sure to to get to the point where we said it isn't about the grade. And it isn't about actually about holding them accountable. It's actually about engaging them in a meaningful way so that they want to participate, right? If they are, if they can, number one, um, and then offer a multitude of ways of being able to go ahead and do that. I know that doesn't really specifically <laughs> address that thing, but that was, we knew coming into this, that this was going to be a, something that we needed to talk about and talk about it openly because it's easy to get caught up in that. So I'm going to um, jump in. I, yeah. Um, just because just in the chat, uh, we had a great discussion on Friday about uh, points positive method of using grades in the grade book to help engage kids in a positive way using that. And so that's a really great one to go back and review because it talks about um, how you can use your grade book in an empathetic way in order to engage kids. And then the last thing that I'm going to share is just as I've been thinking about this, you know, grading when it is used for feedback is demonstrated to show one of the most effective ways to help kids grow. And so one thing that we can continue to do in this environment is get better at providing meaningful and actionable feedback for kids that then, again, like I keep saying, will transfer forward to our practice after this emergency. Sorry to cut you off, Amy. No, and I would agree with Glenn. Um, it's interesting how it seems like the more teachers feel like they are, and, and students actually, the more teachers and students in this situation feel like they're out of control, the more they try to clamor for the things that provide them with a perceived sense of control. And I think grading can be that for teachers or um, it feels like it is is a possibility, even though it really, I mean, it really should not be. Um, and I think one of the things that we've done you know, I talked earlier about how um, we really focused as, focused in the first week on relationships. Um, that transitioned into conversations about learning. And for us and for the teachers who this distance learning experience is going well for, um, and they're getting engagement from their students, is it's not about the the grading process that's traditional that may that they may have traditionally been using in the classroom it's about the conversations about the learning and glenn i think you brought up a good point about that feedback loop has been even more important here because we are well the feedback loop in assignments and using lms's to do that or comment streams to do that there's lots of different ways you could do that but um Normally in face-to-face -face conversations, we've got things like nonverbal cues and eye contact and even just like physical responses that the teacher and student communicate with. And we just have to really emphasize more our communication with them. And that can be over a phone call, that can be over a comment stream on a Microsoft Word document. Um, but I, I think again, that relationship that the student and teacher have over distance learning that's established continuing into conversations. I mean, our district hasn't even officially decided on how grades are going to be reported. And I know that feels really late, but I almost feel like that's a good thing too, because we have taken almost, at least for the time being, grades off the conversation table. That's happening at more of a district high school admin level. And teachers are really focusing or having the opportunity and permission even to focus more on the learning and conversations around the learning than conversations around a grade. And I think that's been really helpful for us. Right on, I wanted to jump in here too and just say that like, um, you know, focusing on the learning doesn't mean that we have no standards and we give everyone a pass, right? I was right. just writing a response to Rachel um, who asked the comment, are you holding students accountable to standards? I would hope that we're holding students accountable to standards. And I don't like the phrase holding students accountable, first of all, but like 
we should definitely be tracking standards attainment. Like if you look at equitable grading practices, really, that's the only thing we should really be tracking is, you know, those kinds of things, not penmanship, not citizenship, not neatness, not attendance, right? So this is an opportunity I would say where we can actually shift some of those practices into something that's more equitable. And I see Makari unmuted and I think she wants to add. I do want to add to that. <laughs> so thanks, Jeff. Um, I want to add just that um, I'm co-signing on everything that you guys just said and pushing this a little further in the sense of how are we defining learning, right? Mm -hmm. um, because we have to remember that parents are our children's first teachers, right? They have something to offer. When our kids are at home, even if they can't get connected, there's still things that's happening. There's still learning that's happening. It's all about how we're interpreting that. If we center um, myself, uh, ourselves as educators in front of kids, that that's the only way by which learning can take place, um, then we're discounting all the learning that our children and our families bring to us as educators, right? And so we have to really push on this notion of what do we mean by learning and really start pushing more towards even in uh, considering the standards, how are we identifying experiential ways by which kids can access through the lived experiences that they have, how can they access the learning, uh, 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 demonstrating their learning in their situation? So even if I'm unable to make it to um, connecting online in this particular platform, because I have to go to work, right? I have to help to bring home money uh, or, or whatever for the family. How can that be used as a way of demonstrating learning because there is a lot of learning that's happening in that not just life skills but even what it takes to be able to to participate on a day-to-day -day basis of all the different balancing effects that go into place and so i think that we have to just push on our understanding of what or how we define learning who gets to be um, identified as the person who uh, enforces or, or encourages the learning? Um, and how do we make it experiential? That if we're looking at standards specifically, which are a destination, how kids get to that destination comes in all kinds of forms. And so I think we have to really expand our, our understanding and belief around that, because if we decentralize ourselves, we actually open up the platform for lots of different ways that kids can demonstrate their learning. And isn't that a great opportunity? I mean, I feel like as much as this has been a really difficult and painful time, I almost feel like this is just like a really exciting time too, because think about the possibility of being able to take those kinds of learning that Makari, you're talking about and moving forward with them when things are back to quote unquote normal and being able to say, look, you know, we always wanted to do that stuff or we always wanted to include those things in our school, but we never had time or we never had, I don't know, the platform. And now we can, and we know we do, and we know we, and we know it's possible. And to be able to say, we're, we're going to keep doing some of these things that we've learned have been highly impactful and highly engaging for our students that have nothing to do with the teacher. Right? How exciting is that? Absolutely, because it really goes back to learning comes when kids can, and, and even adults, when we think about our best learning, it comes when we are able to connect our own experience, our mm -hmm. own needs to what it is that's coming in front of us. When those things are not being connected, uh, I don't find the uh, excitement or the fascination around it. I don't see the connection. Um, then, then learning is stifled. Uh, when we're really talking about kids, and I'm going to use ethnic studies as a perfect example, uh, Arizona came up with a ton of data that showed students that participated, their Latino students that participated uh, in ethnic studies courses outperformed all students that did not, right? And they were graduating at like a 98% graduation rate, and they were going off to college and successfully completing college in the 90th percentile as well. So they were, it, it's about this idea of, of, of three things critical thinking, critical analysis that will build self-actualization, right? So when those things are happening, when kids can see the circumstance, and especially when we're talking about inequities, the circumstance that I'm in is not simply because of all the things that I'm hearing. You know, we don't want to work, we're lazy, whatever it is. When they can see that there are structural and institutional and systemic reasons and, and, and policies and practices that have been in place that creates um, uh, the environment and the situations that exist and are able to critically think. Education then becomes a way that they're actualizing their own understanding and way of being through what do I do to address these systems, right? And so when we have a disconnect and it's simply about 
gathering information, that's not a good enough reason for kids to say, yeah, I want to push forward and I want to do this. And this. it's more around, can I find ways to help them to critically analyze and understand what's happening for, so that they can really build out their understanding of self and then what they need to do in order to move um, to address these, these types of injustices that's happening. Yeah, and I, I would I would just like to add a brief um, addition to that, and, and which is that, you know, grading has traditionally been used to assign judgment on students, you know, and we, Makaria has already talked about that. And so I would say one of the good things that's come out of COVID-19, if I'm allowed to say it that way, um, is that now we're, now that we're finally more focused than ever before on how we engage and support our most disengaged students, um, that it's, that, that in doing so, it's finally bringing to bear this reality um, that, that, um, that, that should, you know, um, basically compel all of us to question whether grading um, the way that it's traditionally been practiced is an equitable way of holding students accountable. Um, so, and, you know, in other words, you know, like are, we should be asking our, how does grading exonerate educators and educational leaders from understanding students' needs and the circumstances around their needs? Um, because any system that is so set in stone that isn't able to evolve with our students' ever-changing needs and experiences, is that the best system or way to do to do student assessment? Um, and so yeah, so that was my that was my two cents. That was two cents uh, adjusted for the rate of inflation for the 21st century. That was a, that was that was the best exonerate that I'm leaving with this. I might just shut it all down from now on. Does do our grading practices exonerate us? Uh, yeah, that's exactly yeah, they do. that's exactly that's exactly right. And that's why in this time, and you know, I, I'm jumping in because I can because I'm hosting the meat session of this, but. Um, I am super cautious about, um, you know, the reality of the situation we're in presents a challenge for all of us. That challenge is amplified and elevated for those of us who are unprepared to deal with day-to-day -day challenges already. So I don't want to, I don't, I'm real cautious about singing the opportunity song that is connected with this. However, in order for us to be honest in our profession and our growth and the things that we care about, if there ever was an opportunity to re-examine past practices, to upend the ones that actually damage relationships and the growth of our children, this is it. And so lean into it and, um, and, and like, this, this is it. The people keep talking about, what, well, I hope that it turns out differently after this hoping isn't going to do a thing about it. You need to do it. And so that's one of the reasons why we're super excited about that so many people have showed up for this thing that we threw together in two weeks. Uh, the reason why the page is there so that you can continue to connect because if you're if you're energized by this conversation, if you are engaged in a deeper and more meaningful way, this is it. This is your chance. This is your chance to go on and talk about fundamentally changing the way our grading practices exonerate the professionals from knowing the relationships with the children and the things that they, that, and Makari brought another great point, the things that they already bring to our classroom and the value of the things that they learn daily and bring to our classroom. Yeah, we've been having an ongoing, uh, kind of monthly conversation. Um, we started uh, with kind of like this journal club with educators that are were interested in examining um, some journals. And, and that kind of morphed into uh, an ongoing one topic journal club that's been about equitable grading practices. Sally Reynolds and myself kind of host that. And um, one of the things that uh, we kind of discovered in, in doing that process was that, um, you know, we have a lot, of, a lot of feelings about the way that we grade. And it is one of the most difficult conversations to have with folks, but it is probably, um, I, you know, the most important thing that we could do 
to make a change right now. And it comes down to, by and large, individual practice. There aren't a lot of, I mean, I'd be interested to see by you responding in chat, how much do your administrators meddle, so to speak, in your grading practices? Or are you allowed to determine how you assign points and things like that? Um, so, you know, back to this whole question about like standards, standards, absolutely, we should make sure that students are accountable to standards because that is kind of the framework of of what we do, but how we get there is largely up to us. And it's time for us to abandon a lot of those practices, you know, if we can see some that we're questioning now. I wanna just speak to this a little bit. Um, for the last seven years, our district has been a grading for learning district. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware what that means, it means that in the, in the semi-traditional weighted scale of grades, assessment is the vast majority of what is graded or knowledge is what is graded and practices really not graded as much. We do a 90%, 10% weight. Some schools do a 100, 0, 80, 20, whatever. And it's interesting because in the last seven years of doing this, we have had teachers who really struggle embracing it and struggle with the idea of grading for learning and giving up that. I just keep thinking about that. Um, Lee's comment about exonerating. Um, I think those teachers have felt that they need exoneration. And so they stick to that concept of like grades and and holding student, students accountable with those grades. And in the last year, we've had a committee that's come back to talking about grading. And a lot of the teachers on that committee were people who were opposed to grading for learning. And um, we had our first meeting of this group post distance learning advent, right? Last week. And it was an incredibly interesting turnaround because many of those teachers during this conversation, I think because of what we've been facing in the last six weeks have really changed internally how they view learning and grading. And it was remarkable to see the change in their ideas um, and how they are starting to more embrace the concept of grading for learning than they ever would have maybe if this hadn't happened. It's almost been a catalyst for their own change. And it's been um, really interesting to be a part of. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Amy. I think the one thing that as you were, as you were talking that came like into my mind that often happens is people will say, well, not all teachers, right? Mm -hmm. Like we immediately jump into the defensive mode and I want people to be mindful of, um, of this, this place of critique, meaning that to be critical, I have to then say not all, right? It, it means that there are some people that do this and there are inequities that exist because people are not um, educators, myself included, are not always aware of how we perpetuate systems moving forward. Um, I think the other piece that I would add is that we have to be reminded that we teach the way we've been taught, right? Mm -hmm. We are uh, creatures of habit. Our minds are, are really lazy um, organs that, that like patterns. And because they like patterns, we repeat them over and over and over again. And unless we do something that drastically shifts that, we go through our process, we learn from other people, our master teachers who helped us to think about things, our own experiences um, that have catered to um, how we understand and think about education and think about grading or, or, or you know, the bootstrapping kind of mentality. And as a result of that, we repeat those things. And so we have to just be mindful. This is again, going back to really being mindful of experiences and how they frame the way that we see and understand the world around us. And unless we are challenged challenged to do something different, we really don't do anything different. Um, mm -hmm. And so just be reminded over and over again that if you have the propensity to push back and say, you know, well, not all teachers, that would be true. And it's also true to say, and then there are some teachers, right? Like it's a, it's a both and situation. One doesn't exist without the other. And with everything there's, you know, with every good thing that we've ever um, established or achieved in this country, there's there's always a point at which it 
becomes a bad thing, right? Like, like for example, the conversation around bias. Bias can serve a good purpose too. It makes us feel safe. It makes us feel comfortable. You know, we can be with the people that we grew up with and we've always known because we reinforce each other's beliefs. Um, but again, it becomes a bad thing when then policies and and, and politics are designed around certain groups. Um, biases and perspectives. And this whole grading issue is the same thing, that perhaps once upon a time when grading became a thing, it was really to help teachers um, determine whether or not students were grasping um, what teachers were trying to teach them in the classroom. But where it's become a bad thing is that now we are beginning to um, see how policies and 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 politics and and the way we think of the student learning experience has been so highly influenced and shaped by grading, you know, like and that's why you know when we started talking about the achievement gap, it was the achievement gap. It was solely based, <clears throat> sorry, it was solely based on test scores, and now we've. Tr gradually transitioned over to the opportunity gap once we realized that, hey, test scores are not a fully comprehensive snapshot of a student's learning abilities. So it sounds like we've kind of run the floor with that topic. Um, anybody else uh, want to jump in? Maybe we've got some other questions about topics other than grading, because that's kind of the way that this went. But um, I'd just like to maybe throw out, you know, um, Lee, since you're here, if if any of the if any of us are working with uh, recent immigrant communities. Um, what would you say, you know, we can do rather than kind of relying on the system? I think it was Glenn who said that, right? Like, or Amy, I, sorry, I don't remember which, but like, you know, the system drives us. No, we drive the system. So what are some things that we you could offer, Lee? Like, what could we actually, what should we do? Well, one of the recommendations I've been making to schools and districts is to be flexible. Um, and with that, I mean, you know, distance learning doesn't necessarily have to be all about online learning. It can still be paper and pencil. It can still be pre-recorded um, lectures. Um, it could still be done over the phone because many of our immigrant refugee families have phones, just not computers and necessarily access to the net. Right. Um, and so, again, not limiting their own imagination to what learning can look like in the context of distance learning. Um, and then number two, to really pay careful attention to trauma. Um, you know, I talk a lot about how many of our recently arrived refugee communities that with this whole concept of distance, uh, social distancing, that it's really led to a, a, a sense of loss of community for them. And for our new Americans, community and being able to lean on each other in moments like this is key to their survival and integration into our society. And suddenly that has been taken away very tragically, right? So they're not now they're not it's not just about them surviving as new Americans, but now they got to make sure they survive this virus. And then now they got to survive distance learning. Um, and so paying attention to how trauma is manifesting in their interactions with teachers, school admins, um, cultural liaisons, because that's going to, again, shape and determine whether or not this whole distance learning experience is effective for their children. Um, and one way that we can be more trauma informed is to understand when they share their stories with us, what's lost and what's gained. Um, for example, you know, I spoke with um, a Karen parent whose children attend St. Paul Public Schools. And, you know, in my guidance document that I provided to districts through our MDE website, I quoted something he said, which was that, you know, when he got the notice that his children's schools were closing, he felt fear that he had not felt since he left his country of Myanmar, where his people were persecuted based on um, their um, minority ethnicity status, right? But he went on to say that now 
that his children are learning from home, he can sit next to his child and see what his child is doing with his child's, child's teacher. And that allowed him to realize, wow, you know, like this is why I did everything I could to bring my children to this country, because now no one can take that right to education from them. So what's lost is the fact that you know, he, he talked about how before his contribution to his children's education, because he has no formal educational experience, was taking them to the bus stop, seeing them climb onto that yellow bus and waving goodbye. That was his contribution, but now that's been taken away from him. But something new that's come out of this whole COVID-19 pandemic is now he is gaining greater access to what his children's experience is actually like in schools. Um, and when we first Spoke, he really just wanted to talk about what's been lost, but it's been a process to get him to understand that he's also gained something out of this, right? In spite of the trauma that uh, the the virus has resurrected. So, yeah. I'd like to kind of piggyback off of what Lee said, which was an incredibly powerful, powerful perspective, I thought, um, just something to consider in our own families. But one of the things that things that I've been thinking about a lot is communication. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I think when we started this, we wanted to like, well, it's better to over communicate than under communicate with our families. And we're getting some feedback that um, over communication is actually pretty overwhelming. And it can be emotional, emotionally overwhelming for our families. We have a lot of families who are like um, Lee said, re-experiencing potentially some past trauma. And to have seven teachers call them in one day or even in one week, plus maybe a counselor, plus an administrator, that's a lot of reliving a difficult and emotional conversation. And so we've been talking a lot about learning that we're taking from this is trying to find, and I had this as a last bullet point on my slide, you don't need to show the slide, Jeff, but. Um, things that maybe we didn't do so well or didn't consider. And I think it's an equity concern. Um, and that I'd like to do better, even when we are back to the brick and mortar learning, is have a better way to track how we're communicating with families and what we learn from our families so that we don't inadvertently overwhelm them, whether it's um, with information, but also just with emotional conversations that I think can be really taxing and do more harm than good. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Say, <laughs> sorry, I was just going to say, Maria responded in chat, should every family have a point of contact um, to communicate to? And I had written right before that, that number is real. I've heard that from several people. And one superintendent that I talked to actually used the same number um, because a parent said, I've had seven calls today and I can't, I can't manage mm -hmm. it, right? Um, but what she said they're doing is to um, just pay attention to uh, those families that have, um, you know, many children at home, especially, and they're trying to communicate by phone, um, is to coordinate their communication, right? So, like, uh, have one person kind of be the point of contact and. I think uh, Glenn would say this too, because he presented, you know, with me in another session, um, kind of coordinating that around existing structures. Like if you have a homeroom structure that works, like let that homeroom teacher collect everything. And that could be the person who kind of calls. We're also looking at ways to use our SIS um, as a place to, you know, somebody earlier in the chat, I think in here or in Zoom, I can't remember where it was, talked about how they have like a spreadsheet of contact information that, um, that people can type in like that a contact was made. So if you notice on that spreadsheet that contact was made, you know, seven times over the last three days, you could probably hold off. Um, but we were looking in a meeting this morning at using our SIS as a place to um, share that contact information. And even, and this is touchy because I think it's a student privacy issue, but even sharing information learned that might help us to support our families who are going through difficult times. Um, so that a teacher knows, you know, maybe don't ask about this on your phone call because we've already asked about this and it was a really difficult conversation. And here's the information you need to know, don't ask, like don't ask them again to go through that explanation. Um, and I know that's gonna be difficult 
there's no probably one good solution, but we were looking at our SIS for maybe um, having a tab for communication or something um, with, when it comes to a student. So if I have a student who I know is really struggling and I'm very concerned about them, I maybe go to that communication tab first to see if anybody else has some information that might enlighten me without calling out the family again. Yeah, thanks for that, Amy. And that's a, that's a great example of one of the ways that, you know, I mean when I talk about flexibility, right? Um, I mean, teachers need to understand that if they have to abandon, you know, grading and um, attendance, that 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 they, they should, because we know that with our immigrant refugee communities, when they are, most of them, a lot of them are in survival mode right now. So we just have to understand that education is not going to be a priority for them. Surviving is their priority right now. And so we can't take it personally when they don't log on or they're not sending in their homework on time. Right. And so be flexible in our understanding, but also flexible. And again, how we engage and, you know, maybe seeing that a phone call was made and, the, you know, it was picked up, that that is already success in and of itself, because for many of these families, it's a lot of effort to just pick up the phone and answer the question, how are you doing? And I would just add that this might be a challenge for folks um, in their beliefs around what connecting and engagement looks like and give yourself room to feel challenged in that, right? Challenged in like, wow, I, you know, this isn't what I normally do and it doesn't feel like this, this is that opportunity to be challenged in that um, and to recognize again how values and beliefs are forming this discomfort that you're feeling around something that's very different than what your experience has been or even practice. So glad you brought it back to that. I'm thinking again of the muscle soreness. Yeah, that's a really good point because I've been doing this work for two years and I feel like a lot of the family engagement, community engagement interactions that happen between schools and, and families, they're so scripted, right? And now what this whole COVID-19 thing is really doing is it's pulling everyone out of their scripts and saying, now you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be interacting with your students and families based on what you know. Um, and that's, I think that's where a lot of the struggles come in. Anybody else have anything out there that's been working especially well for them to kind of link up with families? Have you been able to engage every family? If so, how have you done that? I don't know if this is about, I'm gonna sneak in under the wire here, Jeff. Um, I don't know if this is about engaging, this could be about engaging families, but we've really put an emphasis on having conversations that have with our students and then maybe by proxy with families that really have nothing to do with the content of our course. Um, our EL teachers, actually, um, we have five EL teachers in our building and they divided all of the EL students up amongst them and have made it a point to have one contact per week with each of their designated students um, that has nothing to do with school or content. It's all about how are you doing? How is your family? What are you doing to keep yourselves busy? Have you been outside? And each, each of those teachers is finding unique ways to have that communication with these families. One teacher I was just talking to last night, his daughter made like, I don't know how many, 25 different origami swans. And inside the swan or somehow attached to the swan were questions. And then that teacher delivered the swan to each of their designated students um, with those questions on it. It was just like this beautiful moment of like, hey, I'm thinking about you. Um, I'm wondering how you're doing. I hope, I hope you're doing okay. Um, and it had nothing to do with, you know, I see that you have a missing chemistry assignment. You know, um, because that's, that's overwhelming too. Our students need to, we can show our caring in so many ways when we're with our kids. Um, and that's missing right now, I think. 
and we need to find like really unique approaches and it it shouldn't always be and we talk we have all kinds of conversations with our kids that have nothing to do with content when we're in the building with them we need to find ways to do that that's a critical social emotional part of education and um i just think you know that creativity is pretty awesome on the part of this teacher Yeah, I was just going to type a response to that, but I'll say it instead. But like, you know, teachers that I talk to, teacher friends of mine um, are really feeling that loss too, that loss of those impromptu moments of like being able to express care. So I think that's super important, um, you know, both ways, both from the student perspective, but also like for teachers who are missing that. I do think that's a really important thing to acknowledge, again, in this idea of the emergency situation we're in, is that part of what drove us to education was uh, the opportunity to work with kids. And so uh, your teacher partners, you, your teacher partners, uh, are probably having a sense of loss as well and going through many other things too. So as we as we get to the middle of this hour and start to think about, um, you know, eventually this conversation will wrap up. For those of you that are still here, there's so many things that you've heard in these conversations that you can bring the voice to the room around. And the way that you can do it, the way that you can frame it is when you frame it around the humanity of the situation, right? And that has been, like, that is, Whenever we start to bleed back into our organizational structure, where we start to think about, well, what are the, how are we going to do summative assessments? How are we going to get those grades done? How are we going to do these things? Which is a natural course of action for us because it's where we have been trained in our own biological response to this is looking for our own sense of normalcy. So we're going to go to these things that are familiar to us because it's normal to do that. That is our response to a trauma situation as well. But you who have stuck around for this conversation all the way to this point, in that room, drive back to what are the needs of the people in this situation? And if that is the one thing that we can grow our organizations back to, that return to what the people in the organization need, because it gets out of our control and it gets driven to the organizational needs because it deals with buses and it deals with serving lunch and it deals with locker combinations, all systemic things that need to be cared for and taken care of when we're in, the human part sometimes diminishes to the third or fourth or fifth or eighth consideration. So in this situation, what I hear and what we're all talking about is that that poignant focus on the people involved and what we can do to make this better for them now. And when we are super thoughtful about it, that means what we can do to make this better for them going forward in this practice as well, which is, which is the way that we can get something out of this situation. All right, Jeff, I think um, unless the panelists have any other last, um, you know, two cents they want to drop in that are like nuggets of golden wisdom, uh, then we will begin to wrap this up and uh, allow everybody to move on for their day. We've got more sessions coming up. I just uh, I really, really appreciate um the commitment to this from everybody who stuck around. Uh, we had almost at, at the height of our presentation uh, in the Zoom room, we had 300 people from around the state paying attention to this conversation. So 300 people are thinking about this, which is uh, kind of sort of that remarkable reach that this peculiar position affords us and allows us to have. So thank you to everybody. Jeff, any closing words or anybody else want to close with anything? I just want to thank you. Um, you know, with without your crazy idea of, of getting this together, 
Um, I don't, you know, none of us would be here today. So thank you for like captaining this team. And, uh, you know, it, it was a, it was an interesting effort and really glad I could be part of it and really glad that, you know, um, everybody on this panel could be part of it. And those of you who came to listen, it's an important topic. Yeah. Essential, essential, really. Uh, well, I look forward to um, meeting you all face to face sometime when we're able to do that. I'm going to stop the recording now and uh, say thank you again. And everybody have a fantastic